Good evening. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we meet and we learn from each other tonight on country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land where I live, work and write. I pay my sincere respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us here this evening for community histories. It's your library at home and it's another episode of History Matters. This is a collaboration between the State Library of New South Wales, the Professional Historians Association of New South Wales and the ACT, and the Oral History Association of New South Wales. If you have any questions at all for any of our speakers this evening, please use your chat feature in Zoom and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentations. Your chair tonight is Layla Elmos. Layla will be known to many of you. She's an historian at the City of Sydney. She's the author of several books, including the classic Our Island Home. She's a regular contributor to the Dictionary of Sydney. And she is, of course, a former president of Professional Historians Association. Welcome, Layla. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Rachel. On behalf of the Professional Historians Association and the Oral History Association of New South Wales, I'd like to thank Rachel Franks and also the State Library of New South Wales for hosting tonight's event. This History Matters series focuses on public history and how it shapes our understandings of the past. In this forum, we're going to be exploring issues that stimulate and bedevil the work of public historians. History Matters aims to encourage ref a reflective approach to the practice of history. And with this in mind, tonight's topic is community histories. So we're going to hear from three speakers tonight. First up, we're going to hear from Therese Sweeney, and she's going to be talking about her project, which is called On the Fringes, Southwest Sydney, 1994 to 2014. And we're also going to hear from Jackie Schultz and Lawrence Ryan, who are both going to be talking about their project, Power of Voices. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, we're going to be addressing your questions at the end of the session tonight. So if you look for the little symbol at the bottom of the screen, the Q&A symbol, um, you can pop your questions in there and then we'll um, get to those at the end of the session. So you can post those throughout the session if you wish. Uh, we'll have around 15 minutes questions and I'm going to be moderating those and um, as I'll explain at the end these will be de-identified so you know feel free to to ask your questions. So now I'm going to be welcoming Therese Sweeney. Um, I'm just letting you know that I'm going to be sharing my screen for this but I'll be switching off my camera and my microphone so uh, hit it Therese. Hi, how are you? My name is Therese Sweeney and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about my project. Uh, yeah, it's a big project, so I've got 15 minutes to talk about a 20-year project. So I suppose it's going to be a broad overview and hopefully stimulating for you. Uh, why would I do a 20-year project? Well, it just evolved. I, uh, I'm an artist. I'm a writer. I have studied BA in communications at UTS and I've and majored theoretically in social history and my production major was filmmaking. So it uh, gives you an idea what, what's going to be next. So what I'd like to do is I'm talking about Southwest Sydney, what used to be the fringe of Southwest Sydney and what is evolving. The fringe is always, of course, moving. Uh, so I might, I'm going to show you a series of photographs to begin with, uh, which is how I started my project. So I'll go to the first photograph, which is a group of women at a bus stop. Um, and so I'd never taken a photograph in my life. I wanted to, I just resigned from a fairly high intense government position as a senior policy analyst. And I wanted to become an independent worker artist community person. So I began my own journey. Yeah, so I picked up a camera 
and I was mot what I wanted to do. I grew up in Green Valley, and I was motivated to archive that community images and stories uh, to challenge, I suppose, the dominant classes, who uh, because we were in terribly underrepresented in in local state and of course national archives other than bureaucratic photographs of a house or kids going to school in a community. Uh, and then of course uh, readdressing uh, the battering we, we suffered for 40 years from the press and most of us had experiences that were not necessarily what the press was saying and I, I wanted to challenge and redress that. That was my primary motivation, archiving. I wanted to respectfully re-engage my community and have an esteeming experience and an experience we shared together through the camera. So that's how it started. Um, and I was very motivated to produce outcomes for the residents so they could trust me, so they could see themselves, so they could have an esteeming experience. These are just some of the things, but fundamentally overall, I think it was a social justice project. Uh, that's how some have described it. Okay, so here's the bus stop series. I did a series on bus stops because there was very little transport operating in the six fibro housing estates coined Green Valley. This is in Ashcroft, one of those suburbs, six suburbs. Um, so I did a whole series of bus stops and I worked with women from the resource centres who attended community services and I got them performing for me or simply I'd pick locations and we'd, we'd go and do some shoots. Okay, so that was, that's just an example. All of these, is it? Uh, yep. And the next example, you know, I was just capturing the culture of the time and the change in migration. So we have a, a band, you know, just something simple. <laughs> but, um, and the next image. Um, so I did a whole series with, a, a young group in Heckenberg, which is a suburb of the housing estate. And the kids named, titled these images, Kids Own Creation. So I did some bartering with them. I gave them, ended up giving them a video camera. And I, I, I always gave photos out to all participants and I, I videoed their performance and ran off copies for them, providing they would um, give me a bit of time to pose for the camera. So this is them getting ready to dance. And um, I, I put them in the landscape. Uh, the local library bought all, bought all of these images. So there's a series of four, but I've got three here. So these is in the little bathroom in the fibro house in Heckenberg, which I knew so well. I was actually standing up on the shower, on the corner of the shower to take these photos. This one is quite a popular image. And the next image is in the landscape of Busby. Oh, no, that's Heckenberg too in a cul-de-sac. But I, I took four images anyway. So that was that series. And so we'll have a look at the next image. Again, these are my first photographs I've ever taken. This is film. This is Frank and Shirl, Busby. We get to see the landscape of Green Valley. And again, I think Rob Hurst from Midnight Oil used that image for one of his covers for his album when he was, when he was working with the Ghost Rose, which is his own band. So I always got the work out. Um, strangely enough. So the next image is, um, you know, this appeared in photo file, a photographic magazine, and, and it was quite popular. This is someone I grew up with, a young girl, and her, anyway, called Lizzie. And that's just uh, looking at the backyard, getting into the backyard of, uh, I think that's sadly there, that's another suburb of Green Valley in the, and with the pool. And I like the E there, which I didn't see, of course, but that's Elizabeth. Her name is Elizabeth. So let's have a look at them. And that's colour slide. I always carried about three cameras. You had to at that time. One colour, one black and white, and one large format. So I was pretty hectic. This is my introduction into oral history because I'm learning filmmaking. I'm learning sound design at university in 95. This is on the left is the cleaner of the post office that's now gone from Miller. And on the right is the head clerk that was on the desk at Miller, who I know that I know that woman, uh, known her all my life. But this is just them having morning tea, a simple observation. And I end up doing uh, some extensive photography and they reappear throughout the years in my videos. And of course, I've done 
uh, oral history recordings with these women. And so a lot of these people have since passed. Okay, what's the next image we've got? And that's just another image of, of a woman called Margaret who has also passed away, who was in that previous photograph, Margaret Taylor, and this is her, with, she made teddy bears. So this is her in her lounge room, an interior shot. Okay. So we're starting to see migration, and this is a group of Argentines at Heckenberg outside of their home. Uh, it's a drum troupe. <laughs> Probably the happiest, one of the happiest times of my life was doing this photography because you just never knew what you were turning up to, and you had to. I chose to work incredibly quickly to try and capture, capture them, their essence. Okay, so that's the front yard. Let's have a look at the backyard. Okay, so the backyard, they're, they're making bread and, and this guy with the guitar comes running out the back door, you know. I've got colour shots of this too. He's got different things on. But we'll just move through this. I get a bit carried away. Yeah, so these are just simple images around the estate. A uh, young football player speaks a lot. Sport was a big part of that area. And the next image is Kurdish refugees. I spent the day with them. They were barbecuing, a uh, very rich day, and um, shot some beautiful photos with that. Both There were three families there and their children. Okay, and the next shot. Okay, so um, with all of those images, and uh, at university, I, I started in 95, so I, start, I wanted to develop my theory and my production work and my theory around, you know, forced research around Green Valley media statistics, all sorts of things I was analysing and writing essays on. So I had something to say at university and I drove my work and I had a, a man who many of you would know, Dr Paul Ashton, who I call Jesus Christ, <laughs> but he, um, he looked after me for 20 years. I had a 20-year relationship with Shopfront at UTS and they fed me and they looked after me and uh, supported my work. So... Um, Without them, I don't know where I would have been, really. But, uh, yeah, so I had something to say at uni. I drove all my projects. Some of the films were made back then, short stories that are on YouTube called A Green Valley Story About a Woman. And Green Valley Snaps is another 11-minute documentary, which was a final social history uh, essay. But I've just put that up so you can see all my work has been digitised. Okay, and the next image... So this is shot in 94, 95, but what we're seeing is the, the beginning, the beginning of development in, on the fringe, which went on and on and on and on, and I've actually captured much of it, but that was sort of the start. So that's on Green Valley Road, which is, uh, yes. Wouldn't even know where, where that was shot today, but that, that's just showing you um, the trans, you know, the movement, introduction of development to the area. And the next two images, which was in the mid 90s. So this, then I move into contemporary market gardening, which is the next fringe, okay? So I went to school with many women, many young women who, you know, the Italians and the Maltese girls, and they were market, their parents were market gardening on the fringes. And some of the teachers at my school, they came from market gardening families. So we sort of knew each other. Everybody knew each other. And um, so I did a contemporary analysis of the second wave of migration where we have the Chinese market gardeners, we have the uh, Lebanese, we have the Vietnamese. They're all emerging now in the landscape. Scape. So this particular image called Simon Pax Coriander, I entered into the 2006 Hyde Park City of Sydney photography contest and that was selected. So that was hung in Hyde Park on a big canvas. But that's just a little room. They've got a Chinese market garden. That was just one image. Uh, and I've got thousands of them. And the next image is just another example of the emerging wealth of the Vietnamese melon grower. <laughs> and it was actually Chinese New Year. She was going out for lunch and I was documenting. I was running around that house actually, but I was documenting the landscape and her 
you know, uh, I was documenting growing, I suppose you, you would call it, market gardens. And I did some extensive, so I did a very extensive survey. I also did video interviews. And that uh, toured, that, that went to a few places. Okay, so then I'm thinking, well, what about all those market gardeners from Croatia and Italy who fed and grew our food during the war who I was running into? Who I think I found a, one photo in one book about a market gardener in 2006. That was it at the local face. There was nothing in the libraries. So I thought, all these people are aging. They're, um, we've got to, I've got to capture their knowledge. I, I, always, in, I always liaised with or told, uh, always informed the local government infrastructure about what I was doing. Uh, I always archived where I could at the local libraries. Um, and the State Library bought a lot of my work and it's archived there. And they pay generously, so thank you very much, Alan Davies. But I set up a charity to do this next project because it was going to be huge because I was also engaging the ageing pioneering residents of the housing estate called Green Valley and also the market gardeners. So, um, yes, I can talk about that later. So I set up, I raised a quarter of a million dollars to do that project with one meeting. And Nolene Brown, who at the time was the ambassador for ageing, launched that project with many federal, state and local people, members, and at, uh, at a theatre in Western Sydney. And the next image, uh, okay, so tomato stories. I don't know how I'm running for time. I think I'm running over. Let's have a quick listen. This is... Worked. That's all we did. Worked. That's all we did. The same thing. Typical life was this every day of the week. Sunday we had off. You get up in the morning at five o'clock. You'd go up the farm, whether it was picking, tying up tomatoes, chipping the grass, whatever that was to do. And there was not much water those days around, so the water pressure was very, very low. So then at nine o'clock at night, my sister and I will go up there every second night and water tomatoes till two o'clock in the morning. Well, we grew okay. tomatoes. So. We'll leave it there because I'm running out of time. But that's a, that's a five minute video. I ran in a theatre with seven or eight market gardening women and I uh, interviewed them and, and showed that film. So I'm engaging at the local club. So I, this is, I did a whole series of portraits there. I, I got uh, participants there, but we'll just run through some of the, I set up a studio one day and the bingo players and the bowlers. Anyway, that's just a quick look at the big project. And then I'll finish on this one. I had three key sites in the landscape there that I, that I dug into and um, this is, was projected onto buildings with three other films for International Women's Day in 2008. Silent films. Ivica's a um, retired, passed away now, retired poultry farmer. See, they said if I could crack Ivica, I could get it, probably get access. I had to go on bus trips with these women for about three months. And Ivica, I cracked Ivica, and uh, she she appears a lot in a lot of my work. And uh, she was a proxy bride brought out had to work with her husband, who she'd never met. Uh, many women like that out there in the landscape. The only real contact they have are the bus trips, and she was a member of the Levington Bocce Club where I engaged extensively on multi-layers of media. And uh, UTS currently hosts my archive, not any film yet, but they host the archive. And the reason I went with UTS is because they were prepared to put it up straight away. A lot of my work's not even online, where I've, where I've submitted much work that's not seen digitally. 
because they probably haven't digitised, but um, UT, I digitised all my work with UTS and Dr Paul Ashton selected all of the work with me. Anyway, that's a snippet of me and uh, we can stop that and I'll thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Therese. Um, a lot of um, great visual material there. Um, I hope there are some good questions in the audience about that. Um, so we're going to go to regional Australia now, our regional New South Wales, I should say. Um, our next speaker is Jackie Schultz, and she's going to be talking about the Cower of Voices project. So thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm going to talk to you about Cara Voices. Um, Cara Voices, um, let me share my screen with you. Cara Voices is an oral history app with a geolocated feature, much like a heritage trail app with voices of local people sharing their personal stories about ta personal tales about places in Kara. Kara means rock in Wiradjuri, the language of its traditional custodians. Kara is a town with a population of just under 13,000 on the banks of the Lachlan Weather River in central west New South Wales. It was a site of the famous Kara breakout when more than 1,000 Japanese prisoners of war attempted to, an escape from the Kara prisoner of war camp, making the Kara breakout of August 5th, 1944, the largest prison escape and effectively the only Australian land-based conflict during World War II. Four Australian guards and 234 Japanese prisoners died as a result of the breakout. The Japanese prisoners were buried locally near the Australian War Cemetery and their graves looked after by some members of the RSL's local sub-branch. In 1955, the Japanese Embassy in Canberra initiated a survey of Japanese graves around the country and with the possibility of repatriation of the remains. Eventually, it was decided to bring together all known Japanese remains at Kara, and in 1964, the Japanese War Cemetery officially opened. This is now the resting place of Japanese POWs, airmen involved in air raids over Darwin, and civilians interned in Australia as enemy aliens during the Pacific War. As a result, Kara has become a place of symbolic significance in Australia-Japan relations. Today, Kara is the home of the World Peace Bell. Their peace precinct includes the former POW campsite, the Kara Italy Friendship Monument, the Japanese Garden and Cultural Center, Sakura Avenue, the Saburo Naka Nakakura Park, and Bellevue Hill. With annual breakout commemorations, ceremonies at both the Japanese and Australian war cemeteries and festivals such as the Kara Festival of International Understanding and the Sakura Matsuri Festival at the Japanese gardens. Kara's civic leaders have promoted the community's contribution to grassroots peace building, providing an ethical foundation for its identity. While the peace pre precinct and war cemeteries are considered symbolic centerpieces in this post-war peace and civic reconciliation stories, the personal stories of individuals in the Kara community central to these grassroots endeavors, as well as the personal stories of the people buried in the war cemetery, the Japanese cemetery, remain virtually unknown. Kara Voices and its sister project, the Kara Japanese War Cemetery, Cemetery Online Database, both facilitated and produced by members of Nikkei Australia, address this dearth of knowledge. Nikkei Australia is an informal group of individuals interested in the research, study, arts, and cultural practices of the Japanese diaspora in Australia.
In May 2019, the Cairo Japanese War Cemetery online database was launched. Funded by the Japanese government and created by members of Nikkei Australia, this online portal documents data about all POWs, airmen, and civilians buried at the Japanese War Cemetery. Cara Voice is built on this resource by giving it a human face, providing context and interpretation, utilizing actors' narration to tell stories of individuals buried in the Japanese cemetery. I'd like to back up just a little bit um, and to tell you a bit about the people that whose idea this project was. There were several of us who had worked together over the years. Um, I was a gallery director in Cairo for many years, fell in love with the place and got to know many artists um, and um, Japanese ac ac academics who had a relationship with Kara. And we got together, um, I think it was in 2015, and um, talked about our love of Kara and our wanting to bring the stories alive. Um, and that's what started all of this uh, over a wonderful meal together. Um, we hatched this idea, but it needed to begin with the database. And so it was crucial to have the database de developed. And um, after about a year and a half, that was completed. Um, and it's a wonderful resource and um, it gives the history of everyone buried in the cemetery, as I've said. And I will show you um, further on how the app links to the stories on the database. Um, these, um, I'll go back up here and um, just have you look at the beautiful colors. This is the um, kind of the theme of the, um, the app itself. All the colors um, come from this color scheme. And they were developed by um, a group of students um, from Tokai University who came um, over to Kara and um, we arranged homestays with Kara families. And these design students um, were taken on a tour around Cara of all the significant places that we felt we were going to have in the app, um, historic places, and I'll talk about how we chose those. And given a wonderful tour by Lawrence, who will speak later, um, and really became very familiar with the Cara story. They knew nothing about it before they came and really having them stay with those families made all the difference in the world. And they went back to Japan and came up with some wonderful ideas and sent us their ideas for um, um, colors and the design of the app. And we incorporated those. And um, this is one of the students um, whose designs that we chose, um, thanking us when we did the launch of the app in Cara in 2019. Um, these are some of the people whose voices you hear on this on the um, on the app. These are all local people who had a connection in some important way to the story of Kara and um, the Japanese Kara connection. Um, the oral histories of the local community are of 19 storytellers voices arranged and compiled to create 13 different stories connected to 11 different locations in Kara. The app begins with a welcome to country by a local Wiradjuri educator, Albert Murray, followed by an overview narration by Lawrence Ryan, um, a local historian and um, a member of the Kara Council. Um, sound designs were recorded, um, we, we recorded nature sounds, and then we collaborated with local musicians, Graham Apthorpe, who's also a local historian, and Peter Reeves, as well as Core Far Farmer, um, a Japanese choir, which has visited Kara 21 times <clears throat> in the last 42 years to commemorate both the Japanese and Australian dead with their singing. 
The app also includes other music and sound effects, as well as contemporary photographs of storytellers, landscapes, and historically significant people and events take, either taken or curated by Mayu Kanamori, one of the um, collaborators in this project. The local stories on the Cara Voices app features, <clears throat> focuses on firsthand accounts and memories of the residents, which were not part of the already available literature in Cara about Cara. There's been several books written about the breakout, um, but these were um, people who had such a personal connection um, to the sites um, that we decided to put on the app. And it was um, their stories that, that are so moving um, that are on this app. Um, identifying the locations to include in the app were not difficult as they are mostly already promoted in CARA as areas of interest for tourists. However, identifying and selecting those to, in be, to interview proved more difficult. Although local recommendations were followed, um, some, who, some who were interviewed about a specific place actually had more knowledge of other places. Not all locations had actually had strong stories, while others had too many. So it was a, a lot of sifting out and spending a lot of time with people, um, gaining their trust um, and um, so that they felt confident um, that by entrusting us with these stories that we would honor them in a very important and significant way. Um, the process of creating audio stories from oral histories often requires transforming interviewees into good storytellers. And so that actually involves a lot of good editing as well and to really bring out the best in those stories. Like all successful community projects, relationship building and honoring trust became paramount, especially when the project team members were from Sydney and not Cara, even though we had, uh, many of us had connections to Cara. The relationships prior to the comm commencement of the project contributed to mutual trust the key element to ensuring a successful, a successful outcome, outcome for everyone involved. Um, let me just go down here so that I can show you. This is what I'm showing you is the inside of a brochure um, that we produced um, and that is given out at the Cara Tourism Center. Um, and this shows what the app, when you download the app, um, these are the sites that we selected um, to um, be on the app. They're all very significant in the CARA story and in the CARA breakout story and in the peace and Recon reconciliation story. And in this app, um, you can um, click on um, the, there's several layers to the story and you can click on the site and um, down here a narration and there's also a script that you can read as well. Um, and this um, shows you the back of the brochure that um, tells you, it tells people how to download the app. So when they come into the community um, and pick up one of these brochures, they can just download the app and then go on the trail themselves and learn all about this. The most important thing for us in this whole project as um, people involved in the project, um, the, the team developing this was that always from the very beginning, this was going to, this app was going to belong to Cara. It was um, not for commercial gain, gain, it was to give to Cara so that um, it could be used and could um, and help others learn about this important and really meaningful story um, about Kara and the relationship um, that Kara has with Japan. I mean, there are so many stories and I'm 
Lawrence is very good at telling you those kinds of stories. Um, and he will talk about some of those, but um, an important thing were that all the storytellers um, themselves had, um, because they were so, um, in, in this project was so embedded in them and their, their lives, and because we honored them, I think, they, they um, share this and tell people about this project um, a lot. Um, and so we know that it's being um, talked about and it's being shared and um, they're very enthusiastic and they're wonderful participa participants and it's, um, all the stories are very moving. Um, the, we received a great deal of funding um, to help make this possible. Um, these are our uh, funding partners and um, very, very important um, to the, um, the whole project. Um, we also had many partners um, and um, helped make this all possible. And um, we, these, are, these were the support um, people ABC was wonderful, um, helped us with um, recording studios and um, lots of coverage and really supported um, the project. Um, so I think now I'd like to turn it over to Lawrence and um, I'll stay on with this um, um, screen sharing so that I can talk to these photographs. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Lawrence Ryan. Thanks, Lawrence. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Lila, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about care of voices. It's, just, it's something that I use all the time. And Jackie's given a good overview of how care of voices was developed. And I suppose from my description, I could say I'm possibly the ultimate end user of care of voices because I'm the person who gets to use it all the time. And I use it not only in tours that I do around town, but I also use it to help local people and also visitors to the town learn about care as unique story. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, and Jackie has already given you some background about CARA. Now, I'm a long-term resident of CARA, and I've been involved with the CARA Japan relationship for around about 20 years. Um, prior to that, even uh, about 10 years earlier than that, I began doing tours around town. So uh, I do probably between 12 and 15 tours a year. So you multiply that out, and I've probably done around 450, maybe 500 tours around town. Cower of Voices has completely changed how I do the tours around town. I now can't do a tour without using Cower of Voices simply because it adds so much to the experience of taking people around the place. They don't have to listen to me talking all the time. I can actually uh, play parts of Cower of Voices. And, and the photo that Jackie's got on the screen there was taken back in February. And that's the Japanese ambassador. This is the new ambassador in Australia, uh, Ambassador Shingo uh, Yamagami. And uh, you can see him and his wife. Uh, you can see me in the dark glasses. You can see the mayor of Cower next to me, the deputy mayor, Judy Smith, on the other end of the group, and uh, the Japanese uh, Air Force attache, uh, attache uh, standing there looking on as well. And we're in the Japanese War Cemetery and we are listening to one of the stories in Kara Voices. Um, I've found where it is so useful is it gives a personal story to all the aspects of the tours that I do around the town. It not only uh, personalises it from my point of view as far as, uh, as actually telling individual stories, but you're hearing first-hand stories about Kara and about the Kara japan relationship that developed out of that very tragic story on the 5th of August 1944, the Kara prisoner of war breakout. Now, the breakout, as uh, Jackie's already mentioned, the largest military prison breakout in world history, uh, the only land battle fought on Australian soil during the Second World War. And that's all it might have been if it wasn't for those actions of the local RSL sub-branch members, who as early as probably 1946 began the job of looking after the war graves here in Kara. And what that did, it meant that the people of Kara suddenly had an example, a very clear example of reconciliation with the Japanese people who at the time had been probably our most hated enemy uh, because of the, the way that the Japanese had the, the very strong militaristic code and the way they treated prisoners of war. Uh, 
To the Japanese, a prisoner of war had no honour. So when they came to Cowra in 1955 to assess the war graves, here they find the graves have been maintained by the local RSL sub-branch members in Cowra Council. That so impressed them that instead of talking about repatriating graves, uh, the graves back to Japan, the remains, they began talking about a formal war cemetery. Now, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. It tells you you should always take your phone off the hook, doesn't it? Um, so getting back to where we were, um, 1955, Japanese have come here, they've inspected the place, they find the local RSL sub-branch maintaining the graves, and they look at the, uh, they look at the cemetery and they think uh, we should do something about it. 1962, 63, it's converted into the only Japanese military cemetery, certainly in Australia and certainly the only of its kind in the world. So we have this wonderful story. Now, to give you an idea of how significant the Kaura story, the breakout story is to the people of Kaura, back in 2007, 2008, um, we did an oral history project where we interviewed 50 people in Kaura about the story of the Kaura Japan relationship. Now, the idea was we didn't want to hear anything other than stories, and we mentioned at the time, we want to hear what you were doing during the Second World War and in the years afterwards, but we don't want to go back to the breakout story because there's been lots and lots of books written about the breakout. Every one of them came back to the breakout story. But Kaura Voices looks at it from outside those history books. And there's a number of them, both in English and Japanese. There's also a number of novels being written by people such as, as uh, Thomas Keneally, uh, Peter Yeldum, but Kaura Voices has something that they can never have. And that is individual stories told by individual local people who know what they're talking about as far as the various sites. And where it's a Japanese person involved, that Japanese person uh, it isn't portrayed in, in a patronising way. We have a professional Japanese actor comes on and they tell the story. And that is, goes really well from the Japanese perspective. I've had people who have taken around on tours with me um, saying to me, ah, it's an actual Japanese person speaking uh, because they're used to uh, somebody trying to speak to them, perhaps in, in uh, fractured Japanese. Here, we can tell the stories. And I don't think there's any better photo than the one that you can see on the screen there now with the Japanese ambassador looking at the, the speaker as it's playing. And he said to me, um, when we'd finished playing that particular, um, particular uh, part of Care of Voices, he said, I'm already aware of Care of Voices. It is very well received in the Japanese community. We can have a look at, uh, at the next one down. Thanks, Jackie. Again, the mayor and the deputy mayor with the ambassador and, um, and the ambassador's wife there, again, at another gravesite. And it's prompted a conversation between the mayor of Kaura and uh, the Japanese ambassador. If we continue down, you can see that same site with them looking and uh, listening, and you can see my little speaker that I take along. I've also included some photos just to show you the sort of range of visitors we get to Kaura and uh, the sort of tour groups we have. Now, this is a group of students from the University of uh, Newcastle who are in Kaura. Again, they came up to the, to the campsite and, uh, and the war cemeteries, and we listened to those various stories, and they get these first-hand accounts of what happened at Kaura. So I have to say to you that there's no one more enthusiastic about what Kaura Voices has meant. Uh, those students there, they're ANU medical students who have also come to Kaura. They do uh, work in, uh, in uh, internships around uh, uh, local hospitals and local medical practices um, from ANU. And uh, the group comes and does tours around Kaura and I take them around. But Kaura Voices, I suppose, from my perspective, it's, it's taken away um, the need for me to continually talk. And as you can say, I don't, I'm not afraid of continually talking, but Kaura Voices lets the Kaura people tell the stories of Kaura in their own voices, using their own knowledge. Um, and it's a way of making an event that to Kaura is, is absolutely significant. It's, if you have a story that you can remember anywhere in your life, it's, uh, it might be the fact that you remember the, the television broadcast when John F. Kennedy was, was assassinated or the, the first moon landing. There's these pivotal events. Well, Kaura has its pivotal event. It has the story of the Kaura prisoner of war breakout and the subsequent reconciliation that has led to so much goodwill between the people of Kaura and the people of Japan. And Kaura Voices adds to that goodwill. I'll give you an example of how important Kaura is to Japan. Um, ambassador, the new ambassador, uh, Yamagami, said at a luncheon, he said, a former ambassador 
said to, uh, to me when I went to speak to him that he had once said in Australia that Kara is the ceremonial home of all Japanese people in Australia. He said, I don't believe he, that is significant enough. He said, I believe that Kara is the cornerstone of post-war reconciliation between Australia and Japan. And with that in mind, I can say Kara Voices is the best telling of that story that I have ever seen. Um, just one personal thing, and it's another photo that Jackie has there. One of the great thrills of my life was to get to record um, some of the Kara Voices narration. And uh, I always wanted to be a, an ABC radio announcer. So there you are, I'm recording that one in the ABC studio at Orange in the Central West here of New South Wales. And I was very privileged to uh, go into the studio and do that. But Kara Voices, uh, the, the little brochure, we're already in our second reprint of the Kara Voices brochure. Every day at the visitor centre when I'm working there, and I, I'm only a casual there at the visitor centre now, but I still spend about uh, every second or third weekend there. Every weekend we just hand out these all the time. And I say to people, you don't need to have me with you anymore because you have a tour guide in your pocket. And that's what Care of Voices is. It's a great way of telling the care of story. It gives you oral histories that tell a wonderful uh, story of the Kara japan relationship from 1944 onwards, and you've got it in your pocket as you go around Kara. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for your talks today. What really struck me from all of your projects is the level of personal uh, involvement and connection. So it's a community, there are both community projects, but also they involve a great deal of uh, personal connection. Um, so if I can ask all our participants to um, pop on your cameras and microphones. So we can, we've, got, uh, we've actually got some questions coming through, which, um, so I would just like to um, pose those to you. So we've got two questions through for you, Therese. Um, some comp very nice compliments. So somebody's written in and said, lovely work. And they said, did any of these contributors provide you with photos of their lives? So you were documenting them in real time, but did you get a sense of their past lives? I can't, I'm on lockdown. Yep. No, I no, can't. I think, I think what they were, what they were. Yeah, no, sorry, I can't unmute or see my, start my video. Oh, uh, we can hear you. We oh, sorry. You. Yeah. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, how embarrassing. Uh, of course I did. I scanned extensive archives every, um, and of course, uh, I think with the pioneers of the Fringe Project, there's about 85 extensive oral history recordings digitally. Um, and all archives have been scanned. And uh, there was a whole framework prepared by my board of directors, well, myself and the board uh, around, uh, we captured a lot of the migration experience, a lot about food and growing and methods and social, uh, lifestyle schooling, uh, all those historically relevant facts and information stories about the, the local region. What these sort of pioneering um, Anglo-Saxons, if you like, or uh, uh, all these people are laying really the blueprint. So I want to, you know, if that answers your question. So yes, and um, I'm working on a book next year to put this whole project into that book. So it will be an extensive publication. I don't know where the money's coming from yet. Most of it's been a labour of love. And um, yes, I hope that's answered your question. So yes, it's all bit uh, memorabilia, all scanned. It sounds great. Thank you. Um, we've got just another uh, person that's written in and said so they wanted to express their utter appreciation for everything that you've done to for your former or for their former hometown of Liverpool, of which Green Valley is included. And then they want to ask, are all your videos to be found on YouTube? Yes, there's a, there's a lot of different types. There's some experimental, there's sound with the new estates. There's all sorts of scape, soundscapes. My sound designer was uh, a guitarist from Do Re Mi, Stephanie Phillip, we studied together. Um, so, yes, there's about 
14 films and videos online over the last – and there's quite an interesting 20-odd-minute one about the uh, pioneers of the fringe migrant market gardeners as well, where you'll see a lot of those archival photos. It's photos and sound because this is all run on basically no budgets. And you either Google my name or Memory Bank Inc. Fantastic. And they'll find them there. Um, so now we've got a few questions that have come in about the Cara Voices project, but one I think that you could also respond to in there, Therese. So firstly, um, the question is about how long did it take to develop the database for the Cara Voices project? And then there's another question that follows on from that. And that one's for Jack. Um, the database, um, once we received funding from the um, Japanese embassy to begin that project, um, it was about over a two-year period, um, and there were um, five people involved in that project, uh, four people involved in that project, um, and um, they completed that, and once that was done, then we could go into phase two of our project um, and um, begin the working on the app itself. Um, I wanted to just, um, if I could just share one little thing, um, that one, let's see. Um, this is a, um, a, a WordPress site about the project, Cara Voices Project, and um, that gives you lots and lots of information um, about the whole journey for us with this project, and it talks about our partners. But if you go to the About um, section, there is, there's a link there to the online database. Um, so that you can actually explore that um, online rather than having to download the app. And it's just so interesting. And so that, um, that's worth um, spending some time with, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question that's come through is specifically for the Power Project, but it's about grant funding. And I thought, Therese, you might have some something you wanted to say about this as well. So the question is, can you describe the funding process and how long it, long it took to get up and running? Was it incremental or did it come in one lot? But also, I guess, Therese, for the projects that you do, um, how does that work with, with grant funding? I'm sorry to ask you both sort of the same question, but I think it's something, you know, important to talk about when you're talking about history projects and how they're successful. Would, would you, you like, like to start? Me? Yeah, whichever, yeah, whichever okay. one of you wants to kick it off. Uh, yeah, I'll just talk about the memory bank project might be useful. Uh, I spent six months writing a pitch. Of course, my work has been about developing relationship in that region, whether it be with local residents, but also with key business plays as well as well as government. So to try and get the memory bank, I wrote a pitch. For, it took me six months for the extensive research analysis statistical analysis, and I put a pitch together at Shopfront, paid for my food. <laughs> and um, I went around to government. I wasted a year, local, state, federal, got no money, pitching to all key players, uh, various institutions, and decided to go private. So I uh, wrote a pitch to pitch to four leading businessmen from that region. Uh, and secured the money I needed to run a five-year project at that first meeting. And then uh, a board of directors was established. This was all, you know, I mean, it's all very tightly organised. Uh, yeah, that's how I secured the money for that project. Uh, I often don't have the time to write funding grants or apply for grants. There's just not time to bother with five grand spending three weeks writing for $5,000. I think I've been funded very little for, with galleries, you get paid very little uh, initially. 
uh, I think I secured $10,000 for the Intimate Moments project, which was four videos projected onto buildings, but I had to work hard to get that money. I really did work hard. And with the uh, gallery managers, yeah, bits and pieces, you know, I don't know. It's, you just become wherever you can get in-kind support. I mean, the local council provided me with printing. So, of course, I, I'm promoting the projects. I had postcards, posters, letterheads. Also, I got whatever I could with that printing. So there was always a postcard series coming out to all the local communities at sites, all sorts of things we did. Great. Right. Thanks, Therese. Um, we're sort of running a bit short. We've got a great question at the end, but I'd just like to hear also from from both of you, um, Jackie and Lawrence, just about the funding for that as well. Um, yes, the funding, um, I did show you a slide there. We had some wonderful partners, but yep. I certainly understand about always looking for funding and not spending so much time on um, small grants. Um, it's just so time consuming, um, but we, um, we were able to secure some, some significant funding and, but we also to have, you know, like Therese talked about matching funding. So, and in kind, you're always looking for in kind contributions. And we had a lot of in kind contributions to make this happen. Like, um, oh, just so many things. Um, and, um, then we looked for partners or funding for specific areas, um, like the um, Nancy Shelley Bequest Fund with Quakers um, Australia um, supported the indigenous component. You know, we had an indigenous artist um, work with the um, indigenous people in Cara um, to, um, so we were secured that. Um, and um, then, you know, local support. And then of course, CARA Council was just so supportive with funding. And, um, but we, um, we had to get, we had to kind of prove ourselves, um, you know, that we, this was going to be a significant project and that we had all the I's dotted and the T's crossed so that we could, Teresa shaking her head. <laughs> yes, you have to, um, you just have to really, um, you know, be very focused and detailed um, so that you can um, pitch, your, pitch your project um, in, its, in its sound. Um, yeah. And I do have to say that, uh, that Jackie and the team from UK Australia came to, to council with a, a pretty well-developed pitch. Um, and they already had an established connection. Uh, many of the people who had, were involved um, had worked with CARA Council before. So there was there was that security. And then we were very lucky um, towards the finish, a very generous donation, a, a request from uh, from a trust that had a direct link to the CARA Japan relationship, uh, which which came in quite late and was, was you know, sort of made the, made the uh, project uh, financially viable towards the finish, so. Yeah, CARA Council was so supportive all, all along the way. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, look, we got really short on time, but I did have a question there about Aboriginal um, participants in your project, Lawrence, um, and how um, what the question specifically is, is more wanted to hear from you about the Indigenous Australian connections that Carol Voices worked on. And there is actually sort of a question, it's probably a bit too, not enough time to answer, but just about how you selected the participants for the project. Okay, well, the significance of the prisoner of war site is it rests in an area that's identified as as uh, the Cowra Peace Precinct, and it's a ridge of land that runs from Bellevue Hill, which is the highest point of town, um, north towards where the prisoner of war camp was. And there are numerous uh, Aboriginal identified sites there. Uh, the Wiradjuri people um, certainly have uh, been in occupation in that area for many, many years. Um, and there's things, quite significant sites there, in, including things like scar trees. So, um, it was, it was sort of inevitable because of the location that you cannot tell the overall story of that area without having a, an Indigenous component to that story. 
And uh, I know that Jackie um, did something and the team did something that was, that was very good, and that is to establish the trust there to get uh, that connection, because it can sometimes be quite difficult to, uh, to get that uh, Indigenous connection going there. Uh, and, uh, and Jackie and the team certainly worked very hard to accomplish that. And perhaps, Jackie, you might say uh, just a little bit quickly about how you, uh, you dealt with uh, finding the people who, uh, who were comfortable with being involved in the project. We, we went to um, elders in the community and asked them to, um, well, to, if they'd be interested in participating um, and if they could recommend people. Um, and we had to, again, you know, explain what we were doing. And we had um, Irene Ridgway, an Aboriginal artist, a fantastic woman who worked with us um, and um, was, the, was the liaison, the link um, with the elders in the community. And she was the one that interviewed the elders and, taught, and got, the, got their stories and they told it in the way they wanted it to be told. And it's so important. We, that was such an important component for us in this whole thing was to have the Aboriginal um, story as part of the story of this Cara Voices. To me, it couldn't be told without that. And when you listen to it, you hear them talk about um, the, um, this, the, the rocks and the significance of the rocks and the, um, the spirits in the rocks. And you hear the Japanese um, landscape archi architect who designed the Japanese gardens talk about the significance of the rocks and the resting space place for the spirits of the soldiers who died and the people buried in the cemetery. And honestly, that was the first time I saw those things connected. I heard that connection. And so it was, it was very important to have that be in there. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. <laughs> for our session. Um, we've had some great questions in. Thanks everyone for participating, um, including the audience and our wonderful speakers tonight. Um, so to wrap up, I just wanted to let everyone in the audience know that History Matters events take place on the first Wednesday of every month. And our next session is going to be on the 5th of May. The topic is called Queer Histories and it's gonna be chaired by Scott McKinnon. And we're gonna be providing information about this soon, about this upcoming event. So um, finally, I'd just like to once again thanks, uh, give my thanks to the State Library of New South Wales and Rachel Franks for being our hosts for this History Matters series. And we hope to see you again soon sometime or next time. Thank you and good night, everyone.